this means they're a typical family. Mum, dad, three kids. The kids really want a dog. They beg mum and dad, who eventually give in and adopt a puppy named Muffin. Turns out, Muffin is a great dog. But one day, she chases a squirrel, gets hit by a car and goes straight to doggy heaven. The kids are heartbroken and so are mum and dad. Together, they decide that the best thing to do is to cook and eat Muffin for dinner. If you're like most people, you know that the ending to that story is just wrong. I'm Arthur Brooks, author of The Road to Freedom, and maybe a philosopher could explain why a muffin roast is not really different from a Big Mac, but you know it's immoral to eat muffin. And no appeal to logic is going to change your mind. Our debates about economics and policy work more or less the same way. Once we think a policy or a law is immoral or unfair, we're very unlikely to be swayed by logical arguments saying that it's actually okay. And this helps explain why our free enterprise system is on the ropes today. We all know the free enterprise is the best system ever devised for creating material prosperity. We have tons and tons of data to prove this. But in debates, we're always going up against heartbreaking stories of sick grandparents and poor kids who can't make ends meet, while fat cat CEOs spend a million bucks to decorate their offices. It's no wonder that so many people think that spreading the wealth around makes us a fairer society. Your data on GDP growth are about as likely to win that argument as you are to convince me to eat my dog. Morality beats materialism, period. We know the moral arguments against free enterprise don't hold water, and that they're leading America to be more and more like Greece, broke and hopeless. Sometimes we all feel helpless because our facts about the future of America seem to fall on deaf ears, while the government just grows and grows. What we need is our own moral argument. If we want to start winning, we need to start making the moral case for free enterprise. And it's actually pretty easy to do. The moral case has three key points. First, free enterprise safeguards lasting happiness. Second, it promotes real fairness. And third, it does the most good for the most vulnerable. To start, we have to get clear on what America's founders meant by the pursuit of happiness. Did they mean the pursuit of money? Of course not. Your mom taught you and a bunch of economists have since shown that money doesn't buy happiness. What does bring happiness, however, is earned success. Earned success is the belief that you're creating value with your life and value in the lives of other people. You can define it however you like. Starting businesses, saving souls, raising great kids, making beautiful art, whatever. Maybe it involves money or maybe not. You decide. Study after study shows that people who believe they've earned their success, regardless of their income, are the happiest people in America. But people who don't feel successful, who don't feel that they have earned their success, are among the unhappiest people in our country. Note that the earned part of earned success is key. To have a happy life, you have to work and sacrifice for what you have. A lot of research shows that people who sacrifice do much better in life than those who try to get by without effort. My favorite study involves little kids and a bag of marshmallows. Researchers at Stanford University in 1972 took kids into the laboratory and told them that if they could wait 15 minutes before eating a marshmallow, they'd get a second one. About two thirds of the kids failed. Some gave in immediately, but others were in agony, even banging their little heads on the table to try to keep from eating the marshmallow. The researchers followed up years later to see how their lives were turning out. The kids who had waited for the second marshmallow had an average SAT score 210 points higher than the kids who didn't wait. They also made a lot more money and were less likely to be involved in crime and drugs. Teaching young people to defer their gratification, to earn their success, is clearly in our national interest. But expanding the welfare state is basically just shoving marshmallows into our mouths. Free enterprise is the only system that allows us to pursue our happiness by earning our success. And that's the right thing to do, whether we get rich or not. The second moral element of free enterprise is fairness. Some people and politicians in our country want to convince you that fairness means spreading the wealth around. You agree? Or do you think that real fairness means rewarding merit and hard work? If you came from immigrants, ask yourself this. Why did your ancestors come to this country? Was it to get some sort of fairer system of forced income redistribution? Or was it to be rewarded fairly for their hard work and merit? Most people would agree with your ancestors. They think that true fairness comes from rewarding merit and hard work. 
Here's how I used to explain that idea when I was still a college professor. My economics students were complaining that it's not fair that the rich have so much more than the poor in America. Fairness was their rationale for income redistribution. So I set up a thought experiment. Halfway through the course, I could see big differences between students who were working and those who weren't. The hard workers got a lot of points on tests. Their less motivated friends, not so much. Let's call it grade inequality. We all knew that the students with the highest point totals were the ones who were working the hardest. They might have been a little bit smarter, they might have known a little bit more about economics, but the real difference was their discipline and their study habits. So I made a little proposal. I suggested that we take a quarter of the points earned by the top half of the class and pass them over to the lower half. Now everybody in the class thought that that was an idiotic idea, even the students at the bottom, and they understood my broader point. Beyond providing for essential services and a minimum basic safety net, redistributing income just to get more equality isn't fair. It's completely unfair. The third moral promise of the free enterprise system, and arguably its greatest achievement in history, is helping the poor and vulnerable all around the world. Here's something you might not know if you only follow the gloom and doom in the newspapers. Since 1970, the worst poverty in the world, which is to say the percentage of the population that lives on a dollar a day or less, has declined by 80%. 80%! There's been no achievement like that in human history. Billions of people have been lifted out of poverty. It's the most amazing thing that humanity has ever accomplished. So what happened? Was it the incredible success of the United Nations? Was it central planning or the International Monetary Fund or global foreign aid? Of course not. It was globalization. It was free trade. It was entrepreneurship. It was property rights. It was rule of law. In short, it was free enterprise that saved all those people. If we want more prosperity, and not just for us, but for people all over the world who are poor, we have to stand up for the free enterprise system. It's truly the system for good Samaritans. From the debt crisis to healthcare, there's no shortage of pressing public policy problems we have to confront today. Data-driven research needs to guide our reforms, but each of these issues contains a moral core that speaks to who we are as Americans and what we value most. Earned success, true fairness, and lifting up the poor and vulnerable. Many people in Washington may no longer embrace the values of free enterprise, but most Americans still do. If we want to change the direction of this country, to take the road to freedom, we have to change the way we speak. We have to articulate what's written on our hearts. We have to see that we're not in an economic battle for the future of America. We're in a moral battle. Are you ready?